is what I do. I just treat it like a boss. It's easier to handle when you do it that way instead of when you think about it as social media and people liking you or not liking you. Welcome to New Watermark Photography Podcast, an international offering of Simarca de Agua, a podcast for professionals and enthusiasts to connect and share their stories. I'm Jessica Duque, food photographer and your host. This podcast is brought to you by Sigma, sigmabenelux.com Soho, Brand Studio Whiteybackdrops.com Tether Tools Get ready for a treat because on today's episode we have the talented Julia Konovalova, also known as Imagelicious. Julia is a food blogger, recipe developer, photographer, food stylist, who has gained massive following on social media with her mouth-watering food content. If you're a foodie or a food photographer enthusiast, you don't want to miss this episode because Julia will share everything about her creative journey, her book, her experiences, and her point of view about creativity, mental health, and social media. This is No Watermark Photography Podcast. Welcome, Julia Konovalova, Imagelicious. Hello, Julia. How are you today? I'm good. Hi. Thank you for having me. It's really yeah. nice to be here. She's uh, well known as uh, Imagelicious, so she has a really good presence on social media. Tell us about your journey as a photographer, cookbook writer, everything. Yes. Yeah, so um, I have been interested in food of since I was little. Yes. In fact, just last week, my mom uh, brought me a couple of pieces of paper that she found with me copying recipes on them. And from the way my writing is, I can kind of think that I was maybe 10 or 11. So I was copying some recipes from magazine and I guess I wanted to make them. I don't know. I don't remember. But I always wanted to um, learn how to cook. Always liked cooking. Um, never actually cooked much. My mom um, usually uh, made dinner on her own, but I always liked helping in the kitchen, like for um, when we had like fancy dinners or something. Then, um, so then I went to university. In university, you started cooking more because you're on your own. I finished university, moved on my own as well, and started cooking. And back then, that was mid two thousands. Um, there were a lot of um, food forums. That was way before food blogging became a thing. Way before websites became a thing. Way before any kind of like recipes online became a thing. Um, in two, like in mid two thousands, it was food forums where everyone, you know, just shared the recipes from their own personal notebooks and sometimes not even always not even like half of the time but like maybe one like 10 percent of the time they would take pictures with their you know mid 2000s so point and click cameras dslrs were not even a thing back then or mm -hmm. if they were they were just not popular yes so that's what i started doing i started um cooking from someone else's recipes and taking photos with my little point and click camera and photos were absolutely, you know, horrible. It's like overhead lighting, flash, it's just horrible. Except sometimes the photos would be kind of pretty. So I tried to figure out what was it. Okay, this photo looks kind of nice. Why, why is it? Oh, is it because it's next to the window? So the next picture I will take my food and put it next to the window, take a photo. And again, middle of 2000s, internet was already there. I mean, we had Google. I think, did we, did we have Google mid 2000s? Yes, 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 definitely. Yes. But there was very little information on Google at that point. Um, not a lot of, um, well, anything about photography. It was very difficult to find information, especially information about food photography. There were already some established food photographers, but uh, they weren't sharing information. So I had to figure it out on my own. And then in 2008, I decided I am a food photographer. Why I decided that? I don't know. I was young. I was like full of hopes. <laughs> yes, I didn't have any like uh, inhibitions. I was like, yes, I am amazing. I am a food photographer. So I started advertising my services, and um, 
got a few clients. I don't know how because the photos were awful, but I got the clients and some of the clients I'm still photographing for them. So 12 years later. Um, so yeah, but then I kind of got back into cooking because I decided that, you know what? I actually like cooking as well. Mm -hmm. I don't like photographing just for people. I like photographing for myself. So I started uh, cooking and developing recipes. And then I created a blog. I uh, didn't even go with WordPress. A friend of mine, um, I paid someone to create an actual um, site for me. So they created it from scratch and it was a uh, quite difficult to use, but I was using it. Then then once I started using it a little bit more, then I um, moved to um, Squarespace and then from Squarespace, I moved to WordPress. And like, this is how my blog got more established. Mm -hmm. And I was cooking quite a lot, um, testing recipes and every recipe that I put on my blog, I usually um, tested like three or four times before putting it on my blog, just to make sure that it works. And then pandemic happened. In pandemic, we, especially in Canada, it was a lockdown. We had everything closed. Um, it was kind of scary. We weren't allowed to go anywhere. So I couldn't go grocery shopping every every day. And this is what I needed to do before. You know, like when you test a recipe three or four times, you need to buy enough of the quantities of the ingredients for three or four recipes for like three or four days. So I could not do that. So I kind of stopped blogging. I didn't feel right putting untested recipes on my blog. So I stopped blogging, but then I kind of got back into photography and um, um, well, and that's where I am. <laughs> Maybe you didn't feel like moral uh, correct, like, you know, posting things that you haven't test that that is like mm -hmm. for sure something amazing about your work. It says a lot about you. And uh, okay, let's do something else. Let's focus on photography. Yeah. And I can see clearly the evolution of, of, of your photography. It is amazing. I remember Thank I you. asked you uh, permission to post one of your photos. I think it was one of the teacup with the splashes and stuff. Oh, it, yes, was like, yes. it was like magical. It was a beautiful yeah. photo. And uh, for a challenge I was like uh, doing at the time during the pandemic, we had more time to be more yes. creative and to experiment a lot. So this is one yes, of the positive exactly. things uh, about the pandemic. But tell me something about um, about this cooking book. Yeah, so, um, you know, like when you don't have a child, you have and you love cooking, you usually have time to experiment. You have time to try different recipes. You have time to... Uh, you know, like stand at the stove and like make risotto and with risotto, you know, like you have to like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> stir and pour and stir and pour when you have a kid um, who is uh, crying and needs to be fed and changed or crawling up your leg, you cannot do that. So what changed is that I stopped doing those recipes um, and, st and went to cooking in the oven a lot more. And um, I was doing a lot of like oven uh, blog posts and a publisher noticed me and looking at how much I cook in the oven and they um, offered me to write a cookbook. So this is how this happened. Uh, the ultimate one pan oven cookbook. And this is because I got it, had a child and I had to change the way I cook instead of standing at the stove. I had to make sure that I can create something like, prep something, put it in the oven and forget about it for half an hour, an hour, maybe even an hour and a half and mm -hmm. concentrate on my kid. And um, like some of the recipes um, I developed for the book and I still use them now because they are so easy to make. And mm -hmm. especially in the summer when I want to pick my kid from school and I want to go for a walk in the park because the weather is nice. Some of the recipes I do, I will put it um, into the oven I know it takes an hour and a half. I will go pick up my kid. We go for a walk. We play in the park. And then an hour and a half later, when we come back, dinner is ready. I don't have to stand at the stove and, uh, you know, cook. So, yeah, that's that, that's what that's what happened. And this is what I want to do right now, honestly. Like, put something in the oven and then go and huh? do my errands and then coming well, back and it's done. One of my favorite recipes here is chicken and rice. And rice, you don't have to pre-cook the rice. You put the raw rice in the in the um you know baking dish 
put boiling uh, broth over it, put raw chicken on top, put it in the oven and you forget about it. The rice cooks together with the chicken. It's so delicious. Uh, yeah, mm. highly recommend it. Sounds like a great idea. Like all the juices are like, you know. Oh, absolutely. Oof. <laughs> One of the best rices ever. Like my mom adores this rice. She doesn't need to eat chicken. She just wants to eat that rice. So one of the biggest challenges of writing this book? This one was uh, when my daughter was one year old. Uh, it They originally asked me to write it in four months. I kind of asked for six. They gave me six. So for myself, what I chose to do is I gave myself a deadline. I said four months for recipe development and photo uh, photography, and then two months for writing. Because, you know, you need to not just you know, develop the recipe, you actually need to write it. And for cooking recipes, it's not just put, put chicken in the oven. It's, you know, you need that little blurb. And, you know, in the beginning, this mm -hmm. recipe is amazing because... But Storytelling. Just, yes. Yeah. And it needs to be something like that. That's the part that, like, you know, writing recipes is not that difficult. You know, you just follow instructions. But writing those blurbs, you know, mm -hmm. like 75 of them, Like, how many times can you say this recipe is amazing? You need to, wow. like, you need to add something else. You need to add a story. You need to, so that took a while. The four months of um, cooking and testing, that was challenging because 75 recipes for four months I had to do basically. And each recipe cooked four times. I had to basically cook two or three recipes a day. I had to make sure, like I had a schedule, I had to make sure that I do a few recipes a day. It was tough. My daughter was um, one at a time. Um, it, it was an interesting project. We ate a lot at home. Yeah. <laughs> my friends ate a lot. My neighbors ate a lot because I mean like, like 75 recipes four times each at least in four months. Wow. wow. I, I had a lot of parties. I had a lot of parties. Wow, 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 wow. I, I, I just can say, did, oh my God. <laughs> it was it was insane, but I did it and I wanted to make sure that recipes worked. So mm -hmm. that's why I didn't go with just like making it once. I wanted to make sure that they actually work well and um would work for everyone. Amazing, that Julia. Was, uh, you are unbelievable. Yes. Unbelievable. Thank you. <laughs> Even yeah. with that one year old, oh my God, that is a That was a challenge, like, uh, and you and you managed to do it, and it is available on Amazon. Oh, I have to congratulate you again on the new book that is called yes. the Ultimate Guide to Food Styling. So yes. it covers everything in terms of uh, styling techniques for, for for food photographers. So yes. can you tell me everything about this book? Everything. Yes. So this book, I'm like super excited about this book. I think it's one of the. Um, most comprehensive food styling books on the market right now there are quite a few food photography and food styling books right now but i think there is only one i think this is the only one that it concentrates on food styling exclusively mm -hmm. which i think is um, amazing but also what i do is instead of saying more in more generic terms like um use layering for your um food styling to make more engaging photos I show you pictures step by step of how photo changes when layering is introduced mm -hmm. I go literally one by step by step I move a spoon in one photo like a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right and there is two pictures one with the spoon move one way one with another and I explain why that um, spoon was moved I show you the reasoning behind it because that moving of a spoon like at one point it's maybe parallel to um um the cutting board but on another mm -hmm. one it's slightly at an angle so it introduces triangles and it produces leading lines and it produces more interest and i explain step by step what i do and why i do it and this is the thing not just what i do but why why the napkin is added why there is an extra piece of parchment why and I go again and again and again, and I'm yeah. trying to explain it so that it becomes second nature to the reader. Mm -hmm. And this book is very different from a cookbook. It was very different from writing a cookbook. In, co in the cookbook, you write those little blurbs before the recipe, and that's pretty much the, all of the creative writing. Everything else is very 
structured, right? You know, saute the chicken, mm-hmm. chop the onions. But in this book, it is actually like there is. I wrote eighty-eight thousand words. If like you wow. see how much words in here? My God, Julia! Like, it is actual uh, like an actual book. Um, regular uh, novels are between eighty to ninety thousand, like normal novel that you buy in a store. So this is basically like writing a novel. But let me just uh, an example. Find an example like here. Like step by step. Here I'm I'm talking about styling ingredients. So here we have tomatoes, but you cannot. I know you cannot see in um, in the mm-hmm. camera. But here it's basically the same picture, but some of the c- tomatoes are cut up. Yeah. And here I added some herbs, and here I added a napkin. And each of those photos. So I know it sounds like oh, so why why would you even take a picture of this? But each of these photos has a paragraph of explanation of why it was done. So I'm talking about why things were done. The book is structured in an interesting way. I uh, The first chapter, the first section is, I call them pillars. So mm-hmm. the food styling techniques that I rely on for food styling, framing, um, layering, you know, like, uh, color theory, composition, stuff yes. like that. Then in the second part, I talk a little bit about styling specifically with clients in mind, how to's, uh, tips and tricks. And then in the third section, I talk about food styling of actual, uh, you know, like some foods, like food styling of meats, food styling of pastas. And there I go back to the food styling pillars. Yes. So in the food styling pillars, I explain those techniques. And then the food styling lessons, I we apply the techniques. We apply those pillars. We apply those. So I don't just say that we cut the tomatoes. You know why we cut the tomatoes? Because we had a chapter in the first section talking about textures. And this is why we are cutting those tomatoes because we want to introduce textures and stuff like that. So I just, I think it's an interesting book because it talks a lot about what goes on in food styling mind, in Mm -hmm. food stylists' minds that we as food photographers and food stylists, we take it for granted. We know that we need to cut that tomato to to take a photo, but why is it? So it's a good book for beginners, for those who are trying to get into food styling and food photography to know that, you know, what the tomato, like all the tomatoes shouldn't be the same. Some of them should be cut to introduce the texture, uh, to show the glistening of the juice of the tomatoes, to show how it looks inside, to show the seeds so that it's not all the same. So this is basically how this whole book is done. Every single thing is explained and shown to you and you see the difference between doing it without cutting the tomato and with cutting the tomato. I think it's just really cool. Uh, What were the challenges about this book? Did you do everything by yourself or did you hire someone to help you out? (laughs) That one was by myself. Um, It was a lot of work. Mostly, mostly it was work because, you know, again, as, as I said, I know what needs to be done. I just, I see that there is something missing and I know what needs to be added to the picture to make it look pretty. But how do you put it into words? And how do you put it into words that are understandable to anyone who has never done it before? So that was difficult. The most challenging part was to do that, to come up with them to come up to to this like um extract those all the things that are in my head mm-hmm. into manageable pieces into manageable pillars into manageable bites of information that was the diff- the the challenge taking photos i mean i'm used to it so taking photos wasn't as um challenging because this is what i do anyway it's just Figuring out what kind of photo to take to illustrate my ideas, that was difficult. So uh, what I was doing, um, sometimes I was actually thinking about photo first and then going backwards. Instead of writing a chapter and then adding a photo to accompany it, I was doing the same, I, uh, the opposite. I would take a photo. I knew that, for example, it would be a chapter on again layering so I would take photos with lots of layers and then 
from the bottles I would start writing. Um, yeah, that one that one was uh, much more difficult to write than the cookbook. I thought mm -hmm. it would be easier because I didn't have to uh, uh, make a recipe four times, 75 recipes four times each. But no, it was um, more challenging. How long did huh? it take you? Um, writing, I started writing in December. I finished, I think I submitted it on like middle of uh, March. So the actual writing was about four months. I was writing a lot. Like it was like I would drop my daughter at school and then uh, come home and write, write, write. So I was typing a lot until like basically I had to pick her up. And then there would be another day when I knew that, oh, I had to take photos. So I would take three or four different photos I would have to do um, to make recipes as well. What what was different than this book is I didn't have to take all the photos. I used some of the photos that I already had to mm. illustrate my my um my points, my um, uh, classes, basically my lessons. I was able to use some of the photos that I already had. So that was easy. That helped a lot. I think if I had to, to take all of the photos by myself, uh, that would take another um, few months. I mean, I took all the photos. It's just some of the photos I already had taken from like a year or two years ago. Yeah. Okay, so you can explain your best, your best material yeah. to the audience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, it was a cool experience. I am really proud of this, but it was, oh my God, it was a lot of work. And not to mention that it was combined with your personal life, your client's yes. work with everything yes. else like yes yes I, yeah I still had clients I still had um I, I had a few clients that I had to take like photos for uh for them like uh, three or four times uh, a month I had mm -hmm. I think three or four clients with three or four photos a month each uh so that was yeah so I had to do that what I was doing is I was also kind of reusing um those recipes as well for the clients I had to um it was like one client that was photographing uh, for their plates. So I could use their recipes just on their plates. So, so then I was able to reuse those same recipes on my plates mm -hmm. as to, take into, uh, to put into the book. Yeah, so I was able to kind of, you know, multitask there. So that, yeah, that helped. But um, yeah, lots of work. Amazing, Julia. So book styling is really tricky. It is not something that you can do just because you think you are. You need some guidance and some knowledge. So this book is all about that. So yes. what will, what could it be your your um, advice for those beginners? Uh, well, obviously, get this <laughs> book. Uh, it is available on Amazon. But also, um, the advice is actually very simple. Practice practice and practice again and when you think you practiced enough you practice some more so you go online you go on instagram or pinterest you find photo that you like and you look at it and you don't copy it specifically although i have done that if you copy and this is like it comes with a disclaimer if you copy a photo you do not share it it is a copy it's basically for you to practice so mm -hmm. if you want to practice someone else's photo I think that is okay to do that you just don't don't share it don't pretend like it's your work because it is not or maybe you, know you can say something like okay this photo was inspired by you well, know but that's the, the thing uh, that's the thing there are two ways of doing it you can actually have inspiration by someone or you can copy a photo like I have mm -hmm. done actual like, copying like step by step like fork where they have like exactly the same photo so this yes. is what I'm talking about in here for example, um, just a couple of weeks ago, I was taking a, a picture of pears and to get inspired to take a picture of pears, I went on Pinterest and I was scrolling through like food, food styling, food photography. I saw a picture of pears and no, this is not the photo that I took, but I liked that it was pears. They were on dark backdrop and it was like sort of rustic and moody backdrop. Uh, so that's what I decided to do. I also had pears, so I had dark backdrop. I had like wooden surface and that's what I did. Um, yeah, so that photo was definitely inspired. I did not copy it, but I wasn't like from anyone else, but I definitely was inspired by photos um, on 
Pinterest. But when I was talking about copying, what copying do does, it helps you understand how the picture was created and why. Because you look at it and you can see, okay, what are the shadows? So the shadows are on the left. So you know that the light was on the right so that the shadows are on the left. But also why, like what, what is happening? Like you're trying to figure out what made the picture that you love so beautiful. Is it because they added some textural elements? One of my favorite things to add texture is I take a piece of parchment paper and then I crumple it and then I spread it out again. I talk about it in the book, but you can see it a lot in my uh, food photos. It's just some something that I do, but why do I do it? It's because of the texture, because that wrinkles on the parchment paper, they add more texture. Otherwise, parchment paper is just white. Yeah. So you look at someone else's photo and you analyze it and you see what did they do to make it interesting? Did they crumple the paper? Maybe they did not, which is also fine. But did they cut the paper or did they tear it so that the edge is not as like straight? Mm -hmm. Is it more interesting because of that? Did they move the paper so that it does not line on the on the um, cutting board exactly and it's slightly offset so you can see a little bit of the cutting board and the parchment paper so that there is more textural contrast. So you look at those things and you analyze it and then you practice and you start doing it yourself. You try to see what you like and you try to create something similar if you are copying someone's work, if you are influenced by someone's work, very um, obviously, always, 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 always mention that person, always say thank you, always, you know, um, tag them, always make sure just make sure that you don't copy exactly. I know it's like, it's a contentious topic. When I say copy, I mean, copy for yourself. Don't mm -hmm. share the copy copying work sometimes copying is good to practice it's like with painting sometimes you yeah. sometimes when you draw or paint you copy someone's work to learn their technique do not share it it's not your work it's just it's good for practice amazing so and talking about those beautiful photos that you make can you tell us a, a little bit uh, about the equipment that you're using at the moment like yes uh, um <clears throat> i am a nikon girl i've always used nikons i use nikon I have currently a mirrorless Nikon. It's Nikon Z Mark II, ZII. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite lens is 24 70 millimeters. I use F4. I wish I had F2.8. F2.8 um, F2 was too expensive when I was buying it. So I have F4. It works for me. My favorite focal, um, my favorite um f-stop is 5.6 anyway yeah. i know a lot of people like photographing with very shallow depth of field so they use f 1.8 or 2.8 i i do that sometimes but rarely my favorite is 5.6 i think for my particular style it works because i like blurriness in the background but i don't want it to be too blurry i actually want to have something and also i don't always have a lot of stuff in the background anyway mm -hmm. so it works for me Another lens that I like using is a 60, 60 millimeters lens. For Nikon, it's a macro lens and it is just so beautiful and so like nice. I use it not that often because it is because it's macro, you have to like it's pretty close to the um to the scene. So when I photograph from top down, it zooms in too much. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's 2470. But it, it is just a gorgeous lens. For many years, I photographed with it exclusively. I love photographing with natural light. It's one of my favorites. I have a big window right there. Um, and that's the one that I use for like half of my photos. You can see it on my Instagram in a lot of uh, behind the scenes videos. Yes. But I also use um, a strobes. Strobes are just basically like the flash. I use those... Uh, to capture splashes and you know my action shots because for that you need really 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 fast shutter speed or you need a strobe because strobe freezes motion so i use that as well i use godox ad 400 pro and i have a second one godox ad 200 um 
My tripod is Manfrotto. Manfrotto is uh, a really well-established brand for tripods. I love it. And I also have a, for top-down photos, I have a dedicated C-stand. Well, it's actually a boom stand, but I call it C-stand. It's easier. Uh, the difference between, I think, boom stand and C-stand is just literally the legs. Mm -hmm. C-stand is slightly more stable than boom stand. Uh, mine is still standard, uh, quite stable anyway, so it work. I call it C-stand. It's the same. That's amazing. So, yeah, so your favorite mm -hmm. lenses, or you have your camera, you're an, an icon girl. So, that sounds uh, cool. I remember uh, because you, when you talk about natural light and your big window, I think you were one of the pioneers like doing the, the fake bed scene. So, I will yeah. never forget that. Like, you know, yes. breakfast in bed and that natural light. Amazing, Julia. Always. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love those. Those are some of my favorite photos to create. They are just so cozy. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, and tell me something about the, the social media presence because you have around uh, 110K followers on Instagram. So you have a significant presence and that also is it is translated into your success uh, as a professional photographer, food stylist, cookbook writer, and also with this uh, food styling uh, book. Can you tell yeah. me how can you manage that pressure oh. and the, you know this creative uh, pressure that you can be you yes. know, into? So I, up until pandemic started, I had 2000 followers. So in 2020, I had 2000 followers. Um, and then it was honestly, and I know you and I, we talked about it uh, in our pre um, interview. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, there is a lot of work, but it's also luck. I am a very strong believer in, say, in, um, in being transparent that hard work is not the end of all. Like there are so many hardworking, amazing photographers who are trying really hard to grow their social media with no result. I I talked to quite a few of them, lots of complaints, lots of um, tears, lots of you know anger at Instagram. And it's nothing to do with their work because they are working amazingly um, hard. They post, uh, I don't know, a few times a week, they engage and Instagram is doing nothing, not showing their content to anyone. So it is a lot of luck. I got lucky. I was working hard, but I also got lucky. So what, what, what happened was in um, October, 2020, so it was like six months or like five months into pandemic, when I started to um, uh, do more photos, I took one photo on dark background. Up until that point, I was doing only light food photography. You can see it in my uh, cookbook. Like the cookbook, it's like all like light photos. Yes. So I took one photo. I always like dark food photography. I took one photo in dark food photography. I don't know why Instagram decided to show it to people. People liked it. So I thought, okay, that is cool. Because what Instagram does, what social media does, it like feeds you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the more you get engagement, the more you want to keep doing it, right? You know, the more you get comments, the more you want to share, the more people like your photos, the more you want to keep doing it. So all of a sudden I got like 60 likes. I never got 60 likes before. I only got like 15. So I'm like, okay, I'll do another photo. So I took another photo. I got like 90 likes. The third photo, over 100. I've never, ever, ever, ever had over 100 likes. And this is how it happened i realized that for some reason instagram was showing my photos to people when they were dark photos like you know yeah. dark styling this is how that food style that i'm kind of i don't want to use the word famous but like known for yes happened is it's it's not that i loved dark food photography it's instagram liked dark food photography so i started practicing started doing those and this is uh, how I started to grow. And then at the same time, in August 2020, I think in, it was August, um, Instagram introduced Reels. That was the new thing. And so no one was using them. That was not a thing. So in in October 2020, like after I posted those three photos and dark back, background, I'm like, I mean that service is there on Instagram, I might as well do it. So I created a reel and I created the reel of me 
creating a photo behind the scenes reel. It was October, end of October 2020. Mm-hmm. I was one of the first people who created the behind the scenes reel on Instagram. I wasn't obviously the first. I mean, like there are millions like of people there, but I was one of the first that I know of. It they weren't popping up anywhere before. And all of a sudden, people liked it. Instagram started showing you my reels because I was not only just one of the first people who create BT behind the scenes reels, but also one of the first people to start creating reels because reels were not popular Mm -hmm. they started in august no one was doing reels in october yet so it was what three months in no one was doing reels but i did so instagram kind of rewarded me and this is what happened this is what i'm saying about luck there is a lot of work i was working on instagram constantly like i was posting uh almost every day maybe like three or four times a week I was creating reels. So it was a lot of work. I was uh, doing it purposefully. I wasn't just randomly, oh, I will photograph this today. No, I chose what to photograph specifically based on what my audience liked. And I worked a lot. But because I just got lucky with finding that niche in the beginning, Instagram rewarded me for it. Now what I do is Instagram doesn't like me anymore. (laughs) There are way too many. (laughs) <laughs> no, 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 yeah, that's that's the case. There are way too many people who create behind the scenes videos, which are amazing. Uh, there are a lot of people who show their work and who show their studios. There are obviously a lot of people who create reels. So I'm no longer unique. So Instagram stopped rewarding me for it, but I was able to grow my account because of me stumbling onto this niche um, three years ago. But the way I do, what I do with Instagram even now is I treat Instagram as work. I do not treat it as social media that you do for fun. I treat it as work. So when I create photos, in about um, eight out of 10 times, I will create photos based on what my audience likes, not based on what I like. And yes, those the other two out of 10, I will maybe post what I like, but in most cases, I will show what my audience likes. So my audience likes dark and moody photos, and this is what I do most of the time. My audience likes splashes. I do a lot of splashes. They like levitation photos. I do a lot of levitations, Uh, you know, like action photography with like icing sugar or cocoa powder falling over something. So I do a lot of those. So I treat Instagram as a boss like you don't really like you you can complain about your boss all the time you do like you know I worked in an office I came home I complained about my boss and then I went back to work and I did what my boss told me because this is what you do so Instagram is my boss Instagram wants me to do certain things because it shows my photos more to people when I post certain images so this is what I do I just treat it like a boss it's easier to handle when you do it that way instead of when you think about it as social media and people liking you or not liking you I don't I try not to think about it that way it's difficult but it it just helps right now when I say that Instagram doesn't like me it, it is um it is actually true I'm not like trying to you know like get some attention to, to mm-hmm. get you to say no it is the case um, I complained about it a couple of weeks ago. Um, I posted a photo again out of 110,000 followers. My photo was shown because you can check in the uh, insights, right? It was shown to, I think, 4,000. So it's like less than 5%. Like it was shown like less than 4%. Like, I, I mean, what does it mean? That's, uh, it means that you have to boost it uh, and then, yeah. you know, basically yes. that? Yeah, that's that's what it means. You have to boost it. You have to that's pay for it. Want okay, you want to business. be shown? Yeah, okay. it, it, it is business. Instagram is business. They are trying to make money, so they want you to pay. That's what that's what they do. Um at this point I'm not paying, but they're introducing this verification badge that supposedly will help boost. I don't know, it's like ten or fifteen dollars a month. I mean, maybe because if it's 10 or $15 a month, uh, it's not that expensive. Like boosting each photo for 20 bucks is expensive, but 
having something at $15 a month less, I might do it because I mean, it is, it is difficult. Social media is, you know, like we've read all those stories. We've read all those articles, how it's affecting our mental health. And it does. That's why I try to think about it as work. But I mean, it's, it is difficult when you have 110,000 followers and your photo is only shown to 4,000 mm -hmm. followers. Out of those 4,000, how many are going to scroll and not click yeah. and not engage? Quite a few. Most mm -hmm. of them will do that. So it is disappointing. How many of them are really, you know, like clients? How many of them yeah. are going to know that you are launching a book? And, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly, exactly, because I do talk about it. And then I was talking to someone else. Um, and it's just, it's very random. Uh, a few weeks ago, I posted on my stories how I didn't feel inspired to photograph anymore. And I got so many responses. It was crazy. I don't know why that particular story um, resonated with people. But th that's another thing is like, somehow that one was shown to people. All the other stories are not shown to people. Anyway, that is not the point. Some person responded to me and they said, oh, maybe you should try photographing in this style. And I said like, yeah, that's what I've been doing. Like you can go to my account and see like, like I photographed in this style like three times already. And they went in there like, I have not seen anything from your account in the last like months, it turned yeah. out. So, so it just, and they are the ones who actually follow me specifically. Like they, I interact with them on my stories a lot, but they have not seen my photos because the photos were not shown in their feed. Why? Yeah. I don't know. Because yeah. Instagram oh. decided. That's yeah, Instagram what they... decided to 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 dig a hole and put you there. So basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Nothing I can to... do about it. That's what that's what I'm talking about. Luck. I got lucky in 2020 when they decided that they liked me, and by they I mean Instagram. So they shared my work and they promoted it and they showed it to everyone. So out of my 2,000 followers, my work was shown to those 2,000 and, and recommended an explorer. That's probably how it happened. Yeah. Whereas now they only show it to like 4%. There is nothing I can do about it. And that's why there are so many incredible, amazing photographers on Instagram, content creators who also have 2,000 followers right now even though they should have way more than I do because their work is incredible. And yet Instagram decided that they're not worth it. I don't know why it is sad. It is, I, I can talk, I can complain about Instagram for a very long time. So you, I, I'm going to stop. <laughs> don't worry. All our guests, uh, they have their own opinion about Instagram. So <laughs> aside, of, aside of that, okay. As a mom, how do you balance to have everything like, you know, together? Oh. Because now, okay, <sighs> you have this book, you have to, uh, you know, to to present it to the press and, and to promote it and to, you know, make it like popular. So how do you oh. manage all that? Oh, I don't have it together. <laughs> <laughs> how do I have it together? I don't. That's the answer. I don't. Um, well, she's, in, uh, she's six and a half. She's in school. So that helps. I uh, don't have an office job. So I work from home. I photograph for my clients from home. So it's easy. Air, easier. So because I am at home, I can uh, work on my own schedule and she is not with me uh, for most of the day. So th th this part is not that difficult. It's the, um, the, the difficult part is like if she's sick and obviously she is usually sick on the days that I have client photo shoots because, you know, kids are, they yeah. have this radar. Yeah, they know when friend. to get sick. <laughs> Uh, the managing part is, um, I don't know, it's uh, it's stressful, you know, like you um, try to take time for yourself. I uh, try to um, make sure that I um, unwind. I try to not work after she comes home from school. Um, try not to engage as much in social media as I should. That is one of the things that um, I forgot to mention, but one of the tricks of social media, it works even now, you just need to keep doing it, is engagement. You need mm -hmm. to really engage. So um, what I did in the beginning, I um, and it still works. I do it every three or four months and it still works. And then I get tired of it. So what you do is, that's the trick. People pay money for it. So listen, you go on to your feed 
you know, like the one that you follow. And you start commenting onto every single post that you see. You don't just scroll and like, you actually comment. You don't comment, oh, this looks cool. You comment with a like meaningful post. Oh, yes. I really like the shadows in this photo. Then what you do is you go into your, again, I'm talking about Instagram only. You go into your um, profile and you go to people who you're following. And you go through the list there. And the reason why you do that is because your feed doesn't show you everyone. It only shows you whoever Instagram chose to show you, right? That's what I just mentioned, how mm -hmm. your photos are not being shown to other people. So you don't see everyone else's photos. So you go into the people who you're following and you engage uh, them specifically, like one by one, the whole list. I have about 2000 people that I follow. So I go through, obviously I don't even go to everyone, but like the ones <laughs> that you want, you engage. This triggers Instagram to know that you like those people and it will start showing you their, their photos. Then next thing, you go into your tags and you start, um, you go into like the tags that you like. For me, it's dark wood photography. And you start doing this exact, exactly the same thing. Don't go into top only, go into recent and you start commenting on every single photo. Okay, maybe not every, you don't want to comment on the things that you don't want to engage with at all, but like on the beautiful photos that you like, I really like the food styling in this photo. This fo this colors in this image are amazing. Not just like, oh, I like it, but like actual meaningful thing. Yes. And you do that two or three times a day and it takes you hours. Like it will take you like two or three hours. Treat it as a job, as a work. So you're basically saying that we need to engage with uh, the people we follow and also those tags that are our favorites. So. Yes, but not just that. You also, yeah, the tags. And then you do that two or three times a day so you know like it will take you two or three hours and then you do that every day like every day and wow every day it is it is exhausting but what it does it puts you onto the radar of people who um you comment on like they start seeing you because usually the people who post on those tags are the same people and they ta they post like once a week, twice a week, three times a week. So once you start um, commenting on their photos, you start building a relationship. It's like you and me, right? Yes. You comment on my photos, I comment on your photos. This is yes. how it happened. It didn't happen randomly, right? No. We've been talking for, since the pandemic, right? We, yes. as you mentioned in the beginning, you used my photo in one of the challenges. I, right? That, that, yes. that splash with the T. I entered your challenge. I yes. won a challenge, right? Yes. Remember, uh, <laughs> I got a backdrop from you. You know, yeah. like, it, you build a relationship. And when I say relationship, it doesn't mean that it has to be like friends forever and you talk mm. to them every day. It means that when someone messages you, you know that person, like you messaged me about this podcast. Like if someone else messaged me that I've never talked to before in my life, what would happen? Nothing. But this is how you start building a relationship. So this is why you need to, comment and engage with the same people over and over it helps even now even now with instagram um, um it's a weird with, place <laughs> it, it's still yes even now and it still helps i do it every few months i get I'm like yes i'm gonna start doing it i do it for like three or four days because it takes so much work and then I'm like, no, I cannot do that. I have clients. I have my kid who is sick. I have this. I have to make dinner. And uh, and I kind of stop and fall off the wagon. But the moment you start doing it, not obviously not the same day, but like if you start doing it like three or four days, yeah. five days in, six days in, on the seventh day, you will start seeing difference. You will start getting more engagement. You will start growing your audience. You will start getting more likes and more comments on your own photos as well. It really helps. It is extremely difficult, but this is the one million dollar question. This is something that uh, people pay money for. I've been thinking about even doing a course about it, but well, what is next for Imagilicious, or do you have more uh, oh, projects? I do want to create um, food photography online courses. I have a couple of ideas. People have been asking me for for a few years if I have a course. I don't. And one of the reasons why I never created it is because there are so many other amazing creators who already have their courses. Like, why would I create my own? The Little Plantations. Yeah, uh, the Kimberly Spinel. Yeah, so she has, I have her course. Like, I took her domestic course just because I thought it was, I wanted to see. 
I have uh, on Domestica. There are so many courses out there, so I don't know like doesn't why matter. would I it doesn't matter. You have something to offer. Probably different yeah. than the others. So I have been thinking about it. So I don't know. I, I do have an idea. I have been asked a lot about levitation course, like levitation food photography. So I was thinking that one specifically, like not just food photography, but how to create levitation pictures yes. from the beginning. So this is like something that I do want to do. I just haven't figured out how. Like, especially especially for the post-production part because it's yeah. not only like you know placing yeah, the elements yeah. the yeah. most important part is like how to combine all those layers yeah. and especially yeah. for beginners that they don't know how to use photoshop for that yeah so it would be like yeah, a so, yeah, yeah. So that, that's the idea i was gonna do like two parts one is like uh how to photograph it the other one how to edit it so i am thinking about it i just haven't figured out how to actually do it because the videos that i do on my instagram they're just like so low key i just put a cell phone in a corner and that's it so yeah. for an actual course you need to do it differently right you need to set up the camera you need to set up probably more than one camera like two or three cameras and where do i do it in my studio like it's kind of messy i so i haven't figured it out but this is the last the next thing that i want to do that would be amazing, Julia. So Thank please you. remind us your social media handles, your website, and your yes. book. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So on my Instagram, you can find me as Image Delicious. It's like image that is delicious, delicious images, Image Delicious. Uh, my website is also imagedelicious.com. I don't update it too much, too often, but it has a lot of recipes. Um, my cookbook, you can find it on Amazon the ultimate one pan oven cookbook um and the next one the ultimate guide to food styling i think it's going to be amazing lots of stuff it's um uh, it has really good um endorsements i have um endorsement from my favorite and food photographer is eva cosmos flores she's mm -hmm. just absolutely amazing so she endorsed my book and um i have a Anya from Use Your Noodles, who endorsed my book. So, like, amazing endorsements. I, everyone loved the book. Everyone thought it was amazing. So, I'm really excited about it. It comes out on April 11th. You can pre order it on Amazon already. Um, use my last name, Julia, first name and last name, Julia Kanabalaba. You can find me. There is also a link to pre order on um, my Instagram account. That's amazing. And we have a little surprise for all the audience. So we're going to give away one book of Julia. So we will reveal all the details later on Instagram. So then you can have her amazing book when it's already launched. So thank you so much, Julia. I appreciate your uh, your honesty and all your passion, how you describe your uh, whole journey and everything that you have done that is simply amazing you're a superwoman a superhero thank you so much for having me thank you it was really uh it was really fun and uh i enjoyed it thank you thank you so much and thank you all for listening and for watching this episode so i'll see you on the next one bye bye